Hello everyone and welcome back to some more experimentation in Realism Overhaul Sandbox and in this episode I am going to test out a new version of the New Young Shuttle. Now the last time I tried a variant of the New Young we had Mark II pods carrying the extra fuel on the side here and those flapped around a lot. So for those who didn't watch that video let me go through the premise of this. The idea is that we have a new Glen which is the rocket that is going to be built by Blue Origin and just the first stage of it and the thing about the new Glen is that it is supposed to be recoverable it'll land on a barge just like the Falcon 9 does though that is yet to be proven it has seven BE4 engines burning methane and oxygen at the bottom and in this case it's carrying a little bit of extra fuel for the shuttle so the catch to all of this is that we have a fuel crossfeed system feeding into the shuttle and so the shuttle is also going to be drawing fuel from it and the reason for that is because if we didn't do that we'd have a situation where the fuel on the shuttle would get depleted first uh, and we wouldn't uh, even if you like did some interesting throttling it's not going to work out because the mass is all on the shuttle side and the New Glenn eventually uh, would have to throttle down in order to maintain balance. It's all very complicated, but it's all a matter of the relative mass between the shuttle side and the New Glenn side. I've called it New Young uh, in honor of John Young, the, the first shuttle commander of SCS-1. Uh, the interesting thing about this system is that all methane and oxygen and we are using a Raptor vacuum engine on the tail here and Raptor sea level engines here. So it's a mix of SpaceX engines and on the, on the new Glenn, the Blue Origin engines. The shuttle is currently configured to carry the same payload as the STS shuttle. Uh, we've got 22.17 tons in the bay right now, but we, can, we should be able to carry any payload that the shuttle would be able to carry. And so my solution for the problem of the new young in the previous iteration is to use these sort of Soyuz type tanks. And these are SSTU tanks that have been resized and filled with methane and oxygen. And also I've added a lot of heat shielding. Basically the whole shuttle right now has the same heat shielding that the STS orbiter has on the bottom. Uh, so that includes the RCS ports. Uh, for safety's sake. Uh, I don't really have the RCS ports in uh, ideal locations. Uh, you can see here that we've got some on the bottom, uh, these on the nose. Uh, I, I'll have to be a little bit fancier about where the RCS ports end up. You can see we have three here and three on the bottom uh, down here and that's because those are the ones that need to help maintain pitch on the way back down and we will be trying to bring this back down. Uh, there's even fuel in the wings because I tried to pack as much fuel as possible, but not much. You can see here uh, 10,000 units of methane here compared to 87,000 in these tanks and then uh, 26,000 here, 26,000 here, and 36,000 in this tail portion. So the wings aren't carrying that much fuel, fuel but they are carrying fuel. Uh, we could try and fix that so that they don't have to, but for now uh, that's what I've got. It's also conceivable that we don't really need the Raptor vacuum engine, but right now it's providing a little bit a better ISP when we get closer to space, so I tend to want to keep it, but it's a trade-off between its better ISP and the extra mass. We sure don't need its thrust. So right now our sea level thrust to weight ratio is 1.33, and that's without the Raptor vacuum on because there's no point having it on at sea level when it's not very efficient. You can see uh, it looks like we have very high thrust to weight ratios on the way up, but that's not true. We do thrall down and shut down engines, and you'll see that in action. I've written the KOS script for this, so it will be an automated launch to orbit. The mass is comparable to the mass of the STS shuttle, and we're carrying the same payload. The, the additional catch is, and you'll see the huge wings on this, right? I mean, you're going like, does it really need such huge wings? Well, it's carrying the extra tanks on the shuttle, so it's got a lot more mass, and therefore, on re-entry, it needs a lot more drag. The current mass of the orbiter empty is 104 tons, compared to only 68 tons for the STS orbiter. So we are quite a bit heavier, thanks to the extra tankage mass. And actually, 
heavier than we would be if we tried to integrate the hydrogen oxygen tank of the shuttle in because the hydrogen oxygen tank, the external tank of the shuttle was only 26.5 tons. We have much more than 26.5 extra tons of mass and the reason is because of heat shielding and the fact that this is all structural tanks that need to be heavier and better protected than the external tank of the SES system was. So I've accounted for that. I think the mass involved is realistic, um, much more realistic than using the mass of the external tank and putting on, in which case we'd be something like uh, in the, around 90-ish tons, I believe, uh, maybe maybe 94 tons. So we've got 10 tons extra mass dry. Uh, this mass here includes the mass of the payload. Okay. So you can see it here, but let's get into action. Um, a nice interesting side effect of all this is that, of course, there's no residual fuel. Uh, once we are done, oh, I should mention that we are keeping fuel for returning the Blue Origin uh, New Glen back to a barge. So we've got that locked up here. So don't worry about that. That is going to happen. Well, it's not going to happen in this episode because I don't have a barge and I want to see the shuttle in action and test that out first um, and try and get it back home safely, but that's going to be a long shot. But yeah, eventually my goal is to be able to bring this down and we'll have to test that at some point. All the little RCS thrusters use methane and oxygen. So it's methane and oxygen all the way and no other fuel. Okay, well, I'll talk about the rest of it on the way up, and uh, we'll see it in action. Alright, here we go. So I have to throttle down, and we will let KOS handle it. So, I'm just going to run the script. Now, this is by way of me also trying to figure out how to make a script to deal with the STS shuttle, and that's for the Rocket Profile series, and uh, that has a lot more trouble. That has a lot more trouble. And you'll see that this is going, hopefully, unless something has changed since the last time I tried to launch this, hopefully going to be relatively smooth. I'll close Smart ESS because we don't need it right now. So there's something up about the STS shuttle that makes it different from this. It does tend to this side initially, and that's because over a few revisions I've lightened the shuttle up a bit, and that means that the engines are now slightly out of place for the center of mass. Yeah, so for the real shuttle, I guess maybe the gimbling of the boosters, because obviously we don't have that going on here, or the particular three engine configuration on the shuttle side and the way those engines are tilted, or just the gimbal module itself might be different. I'll have to look into that. In addition to the four Raptor S SL engines and the Raptor vacuum engine, we also have uh, Methalox Super Dracos. And they have much less ISP than the main engines on the shuttle side, but they're necessary for on-orbit operations because there's simply too much thrust coming from the Raptors. And even if the center of mass is a little bit off, uh, unless all Raptors are operating, and especially the sea level ones are operating, uh, it'll tend to flip around a lot. It's better to use the Super Dracos for that. Anyway, we just had the ignition of the Raptor vacuum engine at 10 kilometers because that's where its ISP is uh, finally uh, better than the ISP of the other engines here. So the real trick to all this is the cross-feeding from the New Glen into the shuttle. That's the one really complicated part. Uh, what we just had there was a shutdown of four of the engines on the New Glenn side, and that was to limit G-forces. And all the way through, the G-forces are going to be limited to less than 3 Gs. We'll have the shutdown of two more, though that's a bit of an issue, you'll see. So we shut down two more, and you can see the shuttle tends to oscillate, and it max 
maxes out the pitch and it has this pitch oscillation. And we were very close to separation on New Glenn. New Glenn separates, but because the pitch was already oscillating from the shutdown of the two extra engines in the New Glenn, it tends to have this wobble here. It'll catch itself, it'll be fine. But we don't really want that to happen. And yeah, I'll have to figure out what to do about that. Maybe we sh just should uh, leave the New Glenn running three engines until the end. We'll have to see about that. So right now five engines running on the shuttle side. We're getting close to three G's and then so you'll see it start to thrall down. There you go. It's a pretty fast trip to orbit actually, uh, because we're basically maintaining between 2 and 3 G's for almost the entire flight. Uh, it's very fast. I do not have a uh, rollover programmed in, so it's not going to flip around. And there's no particular reason for it to flip around so that the belly is facing the earth uh, because we're not trying to decouple the external tank. Uh, right there we had the shutdown of the two upper engines here and that's just to limit g-forces and also it provides better efficiency because now the sea level engines are not so efficient and so whereas the vacuum engine was providing one-fifth of the thrust before now it's providing one-third so better efficiency there. But you'll notice that shutting down those upper engines didn't produce any wobble because they're properly tilted uh, through the center of mass. Our target orbit is around 230 kilometers apoapsis and something around 156-ish uh, periapsis. And then we'll use the Super Dracos to boost up the periapsis. In fact, uh, what we will do is we'll bring it to a 300 kilometer by 300 kilometer orbit, deploy the payload, and then bring it back down. I need to change the plume on the Raptor vacuum engine to match the Raptor sea levels. It's still got the Hydrolox plume because the model is actually the M1 model. I should put, uh, I mean we don't really have a, I don't know what a methylox plume actually looks like, but I'm using the Carolox plume, uh, kerosene and oxygen plume on the Raptor sea level engine, so might as well have it match. I did uh, flight testing with this, and that worked fairly well, though we had a high touchdown speed, so that's a bit dodgy. Uh, because it's so heavy compared to the STS. Even with this larger wing, its lift is pretty bad. Um, the catch is that I've done some resizing um, and changing of the masses, so maybe it's thrown things off. We'll have to see. Okay, here we go for orbit. Time to apoapsis is pretty high. We'll see what kind of orbit we get. It's trying to limit the vertical speed here. Okay, uh, 237 by 154. And let me just recycle the SAS. And uh, I, I thought I had the program shutting down these engines. It says Merlin 1D, but it has the configuration for the Raptor, Raptor sea level. And uh, even if the Raptor sea level engines were much bigger than this, uh, we would have space for them. That's not a problem. Uh, the masses have been adjusted. So it's not Merlin 1D masses, just in case you're wondering. So right now, only the Super Dracos are active and we have 487 meters per second of delta V with the payload in the bay. So let us coast to apoapsis first and then bring the periapsis to 300 kilometers and then we'll bring the apoapsis to 300 kilometers.
Hmm. It looks like, uh, based on the adjustments I've made, the Super Dracos are not quite well placed. Uh, though the uh, RCS is catching it now. And there's uh, oscillation, which indicates that they're not really where they need to be. Okay, uh, 303 by 301. We'll leave the payload here. Payload is just a dummy tank. Um, it's got locked methane and oxygen. And we saw in the VAB it was 22.17 tons. I'm just going to uh, decouple and then move the shuttle away. So now with, without the payload we have 500 meters per second. I have not done re-entry testing as far as trying to get it back to Cape Canaveral, so we'll see what kind of retro burn seems logical. We are going to head on over to Australia and start the retro burn there because that's a good standard location to start the retro burn. Most of the time if I'm trying to bring something back from low earth orbit to Cape Canaveral Australia is a good place to be oh uh, I forgot if we really want to hit Cape well, well, well we'll do a, a once around kind of sort of situation I guess which means we might not yeah uh, you can see our orbit hmm you know what uh, let's wait a day so that our, our orbit will really be at Cape Canaveral um, let's open up the cargo bay and get the fuel cells started. We have uh, two fuel cells and we only need one. The shuttle I believe had three fuel cells and that seems to be fine. The fuel cells do use hydrogen and oxygen so that's why you see liquid hydrogen there. That's the one thing that doesn't use methane and that liquid hydrogen is contained up here though it looks like the liquid oxygen was depleted from here so it's yeah, it, uh, this is still uh, KSP 1.1.3, so we don't have the fuel priority thing that we have in 1.2. Uh, this is actually the food, water, and oxygen tanks. Uh, currently, we have 26 days for four crew, which should be two weeks for seven crew. Now, of course, we have the docking port arrangement in the front the Das Valdez docking port arrangement that I use on pretty much all the shuttles. Okay, we should be able to come down on this go around. Uh, it looks like I need some more waste and wastewater containment. We've maxed that out. Also possibly some more carbon dioxide containment. I've got the CO2 scrubber active but maybe we need a secondary CO2 scrubber as well or something. Uh, the water is a little bit weird. Somehow we've got 400 units of water out of 344, so something's wrong there. Probably related to the fuel cell. I'm going to do uh, the retro burn at 115 degrees east. And so let's turn retrograde. Based on flight testing, I flight tested with all the fuel here. So let us make sure. I think the reason we have a surplus of oxygen is because of the fuel cells. I'm not sure. I don't know. It shouldn't have been that much extra oxygen though. Liquid oxygen. So something seems wrong there. All the engines use the same ratio of methane and oxygen. I don't know if that's true of the BE4 engines and the uh, Raptor engines, I'm, I'm actually I'm sure it's not. I'm sure they will use different ratios of methane and oxygen, but I don't know what those numbers are. So for convenience sake, I have gone with this arrangement. Okay, and once we get to 115 degrees east, I'll start the retro burn and we'll aim for just zero kilometer periapsis. Um, I think we need to have it be sort of severe like that. I think the shuttle actually had a negative periapsis when coming down. Uh, we might need something like that. We'll have to see, but then they, we have to balance the heat tolerance issue 
with uh, making sure that I can come down quickly. The problem is that if you're too shallow, you tend to skip up, and this thing has a huge wing, so it could generate lift. Okay, here we go. 484 meters per second was our delta V before starting this retro burn. So we'll see how much the retro burn actually costs. Okay, that's pretty close to zero, and well, call it about 100. It's actually 93 meters per second that we used, but after we flip around, I'm sure we will have used more than that. Okay, uh, let us turn that off. Time warp to atmospheric interface. Persistent rotation is doing its thing. Well, how do I put this? It's not really um, managing the RCS great right now. Let me try and so orient it myself. Stop this oscillation thing going. Oh, I forgot to do one thing. I haven't unlocked my control surfaces. Um, I just limited the control deflection as a way of locking them. 100 kilometers, we're at 145 degrees west. We might be falling short, I don't know. Um, of course, our target is Cape Canaveral, which is 80-ish degrees west. I think 80.6. We have some redness on the cockpit, but because there's realism overhaul, that's not necessarily indicative of anything. And really, the entire body is somewhat red. Oh wait, uh, I th yeah, the cargo bays are turning red a bit. This might have been a little bit too steep uh, re-entry. I'm feeling like I'm falling short here. I'll assess at 80 kilometers whether I need to reduce the the angle of attack, the pitch, in order to gain some more lift. We have about half of our pitch authority used right now. Our vertical speed is approaching zero, so we're getting lift, just maybe not enough. Yeah, I think I'm going to reduce the pitch to 38, maybe 35, in order to get more lift and drag. Why are we deviating? Uh, we have a problem. Uh oh. Uh, hold on. We gotta take manual. I think we have a balance issue. I have this tiny little liquid methane and oxygen tank up front for this sort of purpose. Let's see if that helps. Yep, maybe in the future I should just lock that tank. Mm, nope, I guess, uh, hold on, let me lock that tank right now. I thought it was helping out, but... I mean, it's only a tiny little bit compared to the mass, all the masses involved. This isn't good. And now we're getting heat effects. Okay. Seemed like when I reduced the pitch from 40 to 35, it didn't like that very much. Well, I'll just call this very wild S turns or something. I'm trying here, but it really wants to yaw off. It's like there's more fuel in one wing than the other, maybe? I mean, there shouldn't be any fuel in the wings at all. Well, this is definitely not nominal. <laughs> I'm sure that was obvious. And also, um, it looks like we need to be a little bit shallower altogether. Not zero kilometer periapsis. 
Okay, we've got some overheating indicators. Yeah, all the all the heat shielding that the shuttle has being placed all over the place on this thing is still not enough to completely save it. If we're gonna continue like this. Oh, wait. I think we've got enough uh, atmosphere here. Oh, no, it was just a uh, temporary point of balance there. But it looks like we're through the worst of it. Uh, considering that, maybe I should tone down the heat shielding on this. Because, you know, you uh, if, if you're doing things that are supposed to make it explode, it ought to explode. The issue is that, of course, I, I put heat shield... The, obviously, this portion of the cargo bay needs to have the heat shielding. I, I really don't need to have the heat shielding on top, but I'm not too sure the heat, heat shielding is directional now. I think it, with deadly reentry it used to be. I'll have to check that out. But I'm not too sure the max temps and skin max temps and stuff like that have a directionality to them. If so, I could say that it's only on the bottom surface or something like that. So that if it rolls over, then uh, it, it would blow up. Yeah, it looks like I'm gonna have to take this back into the SPH and see where all the center of mass and center of lift is after the changes I made in the VAB. So we're at 118 degrees west, with uh, which, uh, if I remember correctly, is is over land. Oh boy, here we go again. We're getting to the thicker part of the atmosphere, and it is still wiggling all over the place. Um, nope, not quite over land. It would be over land if we were further north. We're still not at over Mexico yet. And we're coming down pretty quickly now. Okay, we are also upside down. Eventually, Far is not going to like this. Okay, I'm gonna have to sort of try and keep it gentle. Well, I can't. Oh. Dang it. Yeah, I, I'm pretty sure that was far not liking the situation. Yeah, aerodynamic stresses. Okay. Oh, I, I, I called the procedural wings lunar rated because uh, they have... Uh, it turns out that the CSS shuttle's heat shielding is greater than that of the configuration for the space plane wings and so I, I decided to go uh, one step further so that's what that is alright well that's the situation it's certainly better than the situation was for the previous test of this shuttle system but obviously I still have a little bit of work to do uh, but hopefully it'll be operational soon and I can do some missions with it and we'll see about that. I do intend to try it out with some real space shuttle missions and see how it works out in detail but of course actually hitting Cape Canaveral on landing is a challenge that is gonna take me some time to figure out. Alright so on that note, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did enjoy this video, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.